I'm just gonna put it on the record and introduce you. Okay, so the best introductions are brief, uh, but it's hard to give a short introduction to our speaker today because she has a unique and wide ranging program of research and outreach. Um, Amy Wright is a associate professor in the Department of Integrative Biology and Physiology at UCLA. She has additional appointments in the Department of Bioengineering, the Center for Biological Physics, the Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center, and the Broad Stem Cell Research Center. She's also the founder and director of a nonprofit, Science and Food. Uh, Amy did her doctoral work at the University of Southern Denmark and postdoctoral work at Harvard. She was a research fellow at the German Cancer Research Center. Um, at UCLA, uh, Amy's research applies concepts and methods uh, from physics to understanding the physical properties of cells. And she's here to tell us more about that work today. Um, Amy has also created a very original program to use food to teach sophisticated science concepts. Uh, this program began in collaboration with some of the top chefs in the world and aimed to teach soft matter physics to undergraduates and the public. But it's also grown now into a research program. Um, her work is well recognized, for example, by the prestigious NSF Career Award, and her work on food and science has received coverage from major national media outlets. Um, I visited her website recently, and I see that the pandemic year hasn't slowed her down. Um, just last month, she received a UCLA Distinguished Teaching Award, and she was also named Marcy Rothman Presidential Chair in Food Studies. Uh, so welcome, Amy. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you again, Harsh, for the kind invitation. Um, so great to see so many familiar faces again as well. Um, so I'm delighted to be able to tell you more about some of the emerging research from our group. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the technologies we've been developing and the ways that we're applying our findings um, to applications from cancer to cultured meat. So we'll come back to the food. Um, so in my lab, we think about cells as materials. And, um, and this image uh, was what really struck me as a graduate student in biomembrane physics when I was studying red blood cells and learning about how they have this really unique shape that enables them to, um, and material properties that enables them to transition into this umbrella shape as they, they flow through these very tiny arteries and it reduces the drag. And then they can expand back to their original discoid shape, which has an optimal surface area to volume ratio to enable them to perform their physiological function of gas exchange. So this has really been understanding the structure, function, material properties relationship has really been a foundation for the research in my group. Um, we've, we don't study red blood cells, but we study many other different types of mammalian cells, thinking about how they deform through very narrow gaps, what this could mean for physiological and disease contexts, such as cancer and the spread of cancer through the body. Um, physical and mechanical forces are ubiquitous. You know, cells are subjected to physical forces that cause them to deform, shear stresses in um, the blood flow. And they're also always interacting in many cases with their surrounding environment, which could be a scaffold of proteins that um, gives feedback between cells and this mechanical feedback. So across many different diseases and physiological contexts, um, altered physical properties of cells are, uh, are occurring and can drive many pathological situations. So, so when I talk about physical properties of cells, I'm commonly going to refer to them as this mechanical phenotype. And this is what I mean by this is how the cell is deforming in response to physical forces. So this is just an example to show in response to um, some compressive forces that a cell that is more deformable will undergo a greater change in shape compared to a cell that's less deformable. So what is it that causes the cell to behave in a particular material way? So, so we know that there's various regulators of this mechanical phenotype of cells, um, and they're very important for regulating many fundamental processes like how cells move, how cells generate forces, how they divide and proliferate, 
and how they sense different mechanical forces from the environment and convert those into changes in their gene expression program. So many is um, biopolymers inside of the cell uh, have been very well studied, such as actin, microtubules, I'm sure you've heard about. Um, and these proteins can create scaffolds and structures that enable cells to, um, to regulate their shape and structural stability, and also generate physical forces that can allow them to push and to pull and, um, and to move through very complex environments in the body. So to give you a picture of um, one of those contexts, um, we'll focus on cancer. And my, uh, much of the work in my lab has, has focused on cancer because we know that um, the physical properties of cells are really important in many different aspects of this disease. So this illustration here shows you um, an example of a tumor that consists of lots of different cancer cells, also some immune cells as well. And to escape from that tumor, cells need to undergo these very large deformations in shape to get into the bloodstream. And once they're in the bloodstream, they might circulate around and then finally squeeze through another very tiny space between cells lining the blood vessels um, to seed and form a secondary site or a metastasis. So these changes in shape uh, of cancer cells are really critical in these, this process. The mechanical properties of cells are also really important for how those cancer cells might resist fluid shear stresses. And this is highly important in the context of circulating tumor cells, otherwise known as CTCs. These are cells that have escaped from the primary tumor and are flowing through blood vessels uh, and thereby exposed to these, these fluid shear stresses. And um, work in collaboration with our lab and the lab of Michael Henry um, has recently showed that the ability of cancer cells to resist damage by these fluid shear stresses uh, enables them to, um, to survive and, um, and circulate and therefore metastasize. So the ability of, of, of cells to regulate these physical properties in response to forces is, um, is really important. Um, for the cancer cells and their spread. So thinking about um, then how cancer cells might get stuck or lodged and, um, and create secondary tumors in a distant organ, metastasize, um, the mechanical properties of cells are important for that process as well, emerging evidence is showing. Um, so I'm just showing you here this image from a study of biomimetic red blood cells. So this group um, of De Simone made these, these red blood cells that, had, that were made out of hydrogels, but they had the same shape as red blood cells, but they could tune the stiffness by tuning the cross-linking density of these biomimetic cells. They're labeled in red, and then they flowed them into a rat and looked at the lung, which has very narrow capillaries down to several microns. And they could see that in when the particles were very stiff, they got trapped in the lung as shown here by the red dots that are into integrated sort of in between the, um, the cells and the lung. Um, whereas when they were soft, there were hardly any particles got trapped. And so that's just a biomimetic system, but also with, um, with cancer cells, again, our um, recent collaborative work with Michael Henry's group show that when um, these circulating tumor cells um, can stiffen in response to the physical forces of circulation, um, they are more likely to become lodged in these narrow capillary regions of the, um, of the lung. So this was an actual experiment in a mouse um, showing the importance of this, um, again, the regulation of cell physical properties in how cells get stuck in an organ that could be the site of a metastatic tumor. All right, so this sets the stage for why we think it's important to understand this, these physical properties of cells, this mechanotype. Um, so the big question is what are the mechanisms that regulate this, um, this mechanical phenotype of cells? 
And this question has really shaped um, the development of our research program, um, which also forms the outline for my talk today. So there's a big thrust in my lab to build new technologies to be able to study cells as materials. And I'll tell you more about why we think that's important. We're also working to define what are those biophysical mechanisms that enable cells to sense these physical and soluble cues in their environment and regulate those physical properties, like those cancer cells flowing through um, the blood vessels that get stiffer. Uh, and then finally, I'll touch on some of the, um, the translational applications we're working on to be able to apply our knowledge to, um, to make more effective treatments for cancer. Uh, and finally, I'll, I'll touch on a new project evolving in the lab on um, on growing muscle in vitro making um, with the goal of making delicious cultured meat. And if there's any questions or clarifications, please just, just jump in. Um, Amy, your screen seems to have gone dark. I don't know if that's uh, supposed to happen or, okay, now it's back. Yeah. It's, the screen went dark? Yeah, but it's okay now. Uh, we can see a okay. second. Yeah. Okay. That's alarming. Please let me know. I don't, it didn't look dark for me, so please okay. let me know if it comes again. It's back now. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So, so we're going to start by talking about some of the tools that we've been developing. And this is really motivated by one of the major challenges in the field, which has been the limited throughput of methods for measuring cell mechanical properties. So some of the common methods out there for, um, for measuring how the material properties of cells um, rely on applying some physical force to cells and measuring the resultant deformation. There's various methods out there um, to achieve this, um, such as using atomic force microscopy where a small cantilever is indenting the cell and you can measure the indentation response to the displacement. Um, we can use a magnetic bead that can be attached to the cell surface and, um, and use that to apply a, a force to the surface of the cell or even compress the cell or pull it between two plates. So, so in all of these, um, these sorts of techniques, we're applying some physical force and resulting the, measuring the resultant deformation um, and, and the outputs can be described in terms of an elastic modulus um, which is essentially the stress applied over the strain. And, and as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, if we consider a cell that's um, more deformable or less deformable, this, um, a, a cell with a low elastic modulus would be more compliant, more deformable than a cell with a higher elastic modulus that would deform less in response to the same applied force. So for those of you who are not familiar with elastic modulus um, as a measurement of, um, of cell stiffness. Um, this schematic here gives you a sense of the range of, um, of values in units Pascal. Um, you know, cells in the lung and um, in the brain are typically much softer, more compliant than, um, than bone or plastic, which is in the gigapascal region. Um, but many of the cells that um, we're studying, including our cancer cells, fall into this intermediate region here of, um, of around kilopascal stiffness. And just to add in some actual practical, tangible examples, um, we know that common foods like tofu or steak um, are also in that kilopascal region. You could think of a wobbly jello that might be um, closer to the sub kilopascal range. And this is, um, some of these analogies are described more in some of the, um, the physics education pieces that, um, that I've written together with colleagues on using such tangible examples to describe um, concepts in physics to um, students and general audiences. All right, but back to the cancer cells. Um, it turns out that cancer cells are typically more deformable than normal cells. And, um, and, and 
here is some of the um, some pioneering data um, from Superfine's group that um, that began to to, to establish this um, these findings. Um, so these are cell lines from humans and um, ovarian cancer cell lines, and also a normal uh, epithelial cell line. And this shows you the the stiffness, also called Young's modulus, of the cells measured using. Uh, uh, an atomic force microscope, and you can see that um, that that there's a, some variation in the stiffness of these cells. But this normal cell line here has a much higher range of stiffness values compared to um, these more uh, the cancerous cell lines. And it turns out that the 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 more compliant cells, the least stiff cells, are also more invasive. So they're able to um, to more quickly navigate, migrate through a dense matrix of proteins. And this is an important phenotype for cancer because it's associated with um, the ability of the cancer to, um, to spread and that primary tumor to grow. So other findings have um, corroborated these, um, these discoveries, including also in patient samples. This is some work from Dino DiCarlo at UCLA, who's developed an um, a microfluidic method to um, using inertial forces to um, a fluid flow to deform cells and measure the resultant uh, deformations. And again, they find that um, malignant cells have a, a, are more deformable um, compared to normal cells. So these findings are, um, are intriguing. Um, it raised the question of how broadly these, um, this phenotype, this, this altered mechanical phenotype could be applied across different types of cancers um, and also raises exciting potential for this mechanical phenotype to be used as a potential biomarker. Um, it's surprising, but, but a lot of, um, of diagnosis of, of cancer relies on the pathologist's experience and, um, and training to be able to analyze images and, um, and say this is a more severe cancer uh, compared to a more a, a less invasive cancer. So, um, and in some cases, this can require specific labeling of cells to identify different proteins. But um, this mechanical phenotype is just an inherent properties property of cells. So, um, so there's actually some companies out there now that are developing instrumentation um, to use this mechanical phenotype as an alternative complementary biomarker for um, disease diagnosis. All right, and so if we could have um, methods that could, with much higher throughput, more quickly analyze more samples, um, this could really provide a lot of insight into both using and understanding better what are the determinants, what are those mechanisms regulating the cell mechanotype, but also um, potentially have uh, clinical applications. So, um, so over the, um, the years, my lab has been working on building up this mechanotyping platform. So this is a, a lot of information on this slide. I'll walk you through it. Um, this is showing here the number of samples per hour, um, which is important for being able to, um, to measure lots of different variants or perhaps different drug treatments. Um, and we also want to be able to measure lots of single cells per hour because we know that populations of cells are very heterogeneous and, um, and especially in, um, we'd want to capture different subpopulations. So many of the existing technologies are down here in this, um, this lower quadrant um, where you can see that, um, that, that it's possible to measure um, hundreds of single cells per hour, but, um, but it's hard to measure lots of samples simultaneously. There's not that potential to be um, to scale up um, these these measurements. Um, so there's um, there's been more developments in microfluidics that have extended the number of single cells per hour um, that we can measure with um, the rate of which we can measure those. Um, but many of those methods are also um, qualitative and can't allow us to extract quantitative metrics for cell mechanical properties. So 
so my lab has been um, actively developing these um, micro electromechanical systems that um, can actually move, displace, and squish cells as they flow through a channel. Um, we've also been developing um, technologies to, to scale up and parallelize the way we can perform these deformability measurements. And finally, developing more quantitative ways to measure very quickly, rapidly, single cell mechanical properties. So I'm going to, um, to, to talk to you about the, um, this quantitative deformability cytometry method, um, and then also our screening platform today. So, um, so this method we call quantitative deformability cytometry, and it relies on, um, on capturing images of single cells as they deform through this narrow gap that we fabricate out of a microfluidic device. And by applying a pressure, an air pressure across um, to drive the fluid flow, um, the cells deform through these very narrow gaps. And what we did here um, is um, we, we wanted to address this unknown in our, um, in our experimental setup is what is the, um, the actual stress that's being applied um, at that gap. And so we fabricated gel beads that have a very similar stiffness as cells, and we use these as calibration particles. We really wanted to be able to back out this elastic modulus from these very rapid measurements. The time scale here is the, in the order of milliseconds. So cells are very quickly deforming through these very narrow gaps, so we can measure hundreds of single cells in a reasonable time scale. So by tracking the change in shape of the cell as it deforms through the gap, um, using custom image analysis code that we wrote, um, we can extract the strain. So as I mentioned, stress over strain can give you a modulus. So, so the measurement of the strain um, is illustrated here where we can track that change in shape as the cell flows through this very narrow gap. And we can plot that as a uh, circularity, which is, um, is related to the, um, where uh, the circularity index for a perfect circle is one. And as it becomes more deformed, less circular, um, we get a lower circularity index as shown in the red. So by plotting these, cha these shape change tra trajectories for hundreds of individual cells, you can see here, we can plot these over time as the cells flow through those very narrow gaps. We can get a, a time dependent shape change curve. And to be able to really extract a value for elastic modulus, we then wanted to apply, uh, we would turn to existing models that describe cells as materials. So we tested several models such as a standard linear solid, a uh, spring dash pot model or the Kelvin Voigt. Um, we found that the best fit was with the power law rheology. So as many of you may know, power law rheology, power law rheology has been used to describe the material of, um, or the behavior of soft materials from bread dough to liquid crystals and had previously been used to describe cells as materials as well. So the, um, the power law was re reflecting the broad distribution of time scales of deformation and stress dissipation that's due to the complex internal structures in soft materials like cells. So here this equation is um, showing the, um, the strain depending on time and then our applied stress. Uh, e is our elastic modulus here. And this term here is our time dependent, um, our time dependence where the beta is the power law exponent that is reflecting the rate of stress dissipation. Tau here is our characteristic time scale, which we just set to one second. And for viscoelastic materials, that beta is going to be between about typically 0.1 to 0.5. So for a purely elastic material, beta is going to be zero. So this equation just reduces to Hooke's law, where there's no time dependence on this creep response or on this time-dependent shape change. However, for um, a purely viscous material, beta would be one. 
Um, and this reduces to the Newtonian liquid droplet model. So using this, um, we are able to extract uh, an elastic modulus for our cells, um, which was very exciting because it gives us the power to, um, to get an, a, a metric of cell mechanical properties similar to the gold standard atomic force microscopy, um, but we're getting this measurement with much higher throughput now. So here's just an example of some of that data. Each dot on this plot represents a single cell. Um, and this is the um, apparent elastic modulus. Um, we say it's apparent here because we're averaging the stress applied over time, um, which is actually changing as the cell deforms through this very narrow gap. But this shows you that um, there is some distribution of elastic modulus values or stiffness of individual cells. Uh, but we can see with the most dense region um, around um, this red region, that it's about a kilopascal, which is very similar to measurements that had previously been done on the same type of cells using the atomic force microscope. So we've since gone on to apply this method to, um, to many different types of cancer cells and other types of applications. And, uh, and again, it's a very fast and, um, and rapid method to be able to extract now these, um, these uh, calibrated measurements of cell stiffness. So, so that's- sorry, uh, Amy, oh, yeah. Um, within a single cell type, is there a correlation between the, the stiffness and the invasiveness? So even not comparing between different cell types. So for example, in this graph, you have a dispersion. Yes. Um, so that we haven't been able to do um, because, um, well, it's very simple to measure now the mechanical properties of individual cells. It's much more difficult to measure the invasive properties of individual cells and measure their, um, their stiffness at the same time. So, um, so we've done that exactly what you described for different cell types with different perturbations, like using drugs or um, knock down a particular proteins. Um, and we do find that, um, that generally the more invasive cells tend to be more deformable. So they're less stiff, mm -hmm. um, but we do find cases and ha that has been reported in the literature as well, certain contexts where the stiffer cells are actually more invasive. Okay. So this is still a puzzle that we're trying to solve, but um, yeah, I think uh, generally, I think that the, um, the more invasive cancer cells tend to be more deformable, but, um, but if you start with a cancer cell and then activate it to become more invasive, um, we do see sometimes there's an increased stiffness, which we think is because of active forces generated by the cell, such so as through actomycin um, force generation that cause it to become stiffer, sort of like a muscle tensing. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Thank you. Can I ask before we go on, are, the, are these yeah. cells that you're showing here, are they spherical or are they disc-like? And if they're so disc-like, are, are, are you confining them so that they're coming through in one orientation or? So these are, thank you for that question. Um, so these are, um, are generally spherical cells to start, um, but the microfluidic device is, um, I think in this experiment, we were using about 10 micron height. So they are slightly confined, um, and, uh, but they're not discoid in shape, but um, slightly, um, their diameter is typically about 12 microns. So they're just slightly confined in the Z plane, uh, but then they really have to um, deform more severely through um, the narrow gap there. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? All right, so, so we were um, very excited with this, um, this new method to be able to, um, to quantify single cell properties much more quickly, um, but it still doesn't address this issue of how can we start to measure many more samples across um, say hundreds of different samples. So in, in biology, the, um, the evolution of these higher throughput methods has really opened up a lot of discoveries because you can 
knock down particular genes or treat cells with thousands of compounds and, um, and then screen across this vast phase space essentially to, um, to identify um, what's changing your phenotype. Um, and so um, this, was, um, this has been a major, um, a major goal of ours and, and dream really to be able to conduct such um, similar um, analogous measurements using deformability as a readout. Um, so we set out to, um, to create a method to enable this um, functionality um, and we call this um, a microfiltration. Um, and this is what enables us to get to measure much larger numbers of samples in a reasonable time scale. Now, in this method, we're not looking at single cells, we're rather looking at uh, a population of cells, but the way it works is, um, is very straightforward. Um, we apply pressure to cells that are um, placed on top of a porous membrane, and that pressure drives the, the suspension to filter through these pores. And, um, and we're able to discern between samples um, based on the amount of filtration that happens. So here, for example, is a cell that um, tends to occlude that pore. Um, and so there's going to be more retention of that filtrate um, and less filtrate. Whereas a cell that is more readily filterable, it can, these cells can more easily pass through those narrow pores, will have more filtrate and less retention. So this general concept had been um, discovered decades ago in, um, in understanding the physical properties of blood and flowing red blood cells through these polycarbonate membranes. Um, and, um, and analogously, if you've ever had boba or bubble tea, um, you can intuit how you, know, you need to apply more pressure in order to, um, to get a stiff tapioca ball to deform through this very narrow pore. So, um, so over the years, we've developed this prototype device. Um, this is Najok Cargill, a PhD student who worked on this project. Um, and we really conducted some rigorous characterization um, to be able to understand how this is working. And so we can really think of this filtration process in terms of Darcy's law, which describes the flow um, through porous media. So here, this equation is showing us the flow rate um, which is the, the, um, the volume per time um, that's flowing through uh, across a porous, um, a porous membrane or porous surface. Um, so here the, um, the delta P is the applied pressure driving that flow. A is the area of your membrane. L is the thickness, mu is the viscosity. And KT here is the, K is the permeability. And in our case that um, this permeability is time dependent because as time goes on and this flow, this, this cell suspension flows through the membrane, there's going to be progressive clogging or occlusion of those pores and the permeability will decrease. And so we, um, we've characterized this very, um, very rigorously um, using different types of um, pore sizes and, um, and also characterizing other parameters as well, um, which I'll get to in the next slide. So, so we have this set up and we can, um, we can construct it so that it has a multi-well format. So we can run multiple sam samples simultaneously. And to show that, um, that proof of concept, we took uh, over 10 different um, cancer cell lines here. This was in collaboration with um, Ruprecht Fiedemeyer, who's formerly at Cedar sinai um, And he generated um, some cells that were um, ovarian cancer cells that were more invasive, more resistant to drugs, um, and he had some that were not. Um, and so the important thing here, um, I'm happy to go into more detail about the biology, but the important thing here is that these, um, these red cells here are, are, you could say more cancerous. They're, um, they're typically more invasive, drug resistant, and they consistently had a lower percent retention. So less fluid would gather on the, um, on the top of the membrane after applying that pressure to drive it through compared to these um, less cancerous cells. And these are commonly known as um, referred to as epithelial type cancer cells and mesenchymal type cancer cells. 
Um, so, so of course, there's various factors that could be affecting the filtration, right? So cell size is one obvious factor. If the cells were very, very large, it would be reasonable that there would be less filtration happening on the same time scale compared to the more deformable cells. Um, but we saw that there were no significant changes in cell size. And then we also very carefully studied the effect of the pore size, the applied pressure, filtration time, the density of cells as well, and also um, surface treatment um, to make sure that there was no adhesion of the cells to the membrane. So, so we also characterized um, using the, um, the canonical sort of protein biomarkers. Um, and this just showed that our, indeed these red um, cells were, had um, biomarkers that were more reflective of this mesenchymal phenotype. So we then um, went on to, um, to test the effects of, um, to see if we could detect changes in the cell deformability, the cell filtration um, with chemotherapy treatment. Um, so we treated cells with this common drug called paclitaxel. Um, and this wasn't too surprising because paclitaxel is known to stabilize microtubules, which are um, an important site of skeletal protein. And we could see that with increasing um, concentrations of the drug, um, these cells all started to exhibit um, increased, um, increased retention, um, suggesting that they were becoming uh, less deformable. They're blocking more of these pores. But this was very interesting to us because it suggested that maybe we could start to use this platform to identify drugs um, that could change the deformability of the cells and therefore have an effect on their cancerous phenotype. So we, um, we went about um, trying to make a platform that um, would enable um, scaling up this, um, this system so that it could interface with, um, with high throughput screening equipment that's in our core facility at UCLA. Um, and the key takeaway here is that we were able to, um, to use um, methods in soft lithography to, um, to generate a template of this device that can be um, patterned using the soft silicon material, polydimethylsiloxane. Um, and then secondly, we were able to, um, to quantify the volume um, in, in um, uh, sort of metric for the deformability. Um, and, and importantly, the volume of the media, which contains this, um, this phenol red, which absorbs at 550 nanometers, um, we were able to use this as a way to, um, as a readout for the volume that's retained above the filtration membrane, um, and then use that as a metric to identify compounds that would be making these cancer cells um, less deformable. So Navjo went through this heroic exercise of integrating our devices into this high throughput system and, um, and cut to the chase. Here's some of the data that we got out. We, uh, we treated these ovarian cancer cells with 1,280 different compounds. Um, these are pharmacologically active compounds. So basically they're approved drugs for, um, from, different, um, from different diseases, from different um, contexts. Um, we treated the cells with these, um, these compounds and then, um, and then performed the filtration assay and found that um, you can see uh, the colored um, dots here are representing compounds that caused a significant increase in that retention volume, the amount of volume that is above the, the filtration membrane. And, um, and the colored dots here are what we define as statistically significant hits, so um, compared to our vehicle control. So if we look more into what these compounds are, um, that are making these cancer cells less deformable, um, they come from lots of different categories that um, some affect the cytoskeleton and the extracellular matrix, the scaffold around the cells, uh, and others come from um, regulate cell cycle. Um, so we, um, these two top compounds, the ones that cause the highest significant change in filtration volume, um, in the retention volume are, are targeting microtubules. So that was 
gratifying to see, but then we started to identify other compounds as well that were previously undescribed to um, and unknown how they would affect the physical properties of cells. So we, um, NAPJO went about um, and conducted a lot more experiments to, um, to be able to um, validate that these compounds are actually affecting the deformability of cells. Um, she also looked into the effects on the, um, the, the, the toxicity um, effects on cell cycle. This is a lot of data and, um, and I won't go through every bit of it. The main message here is that the top hits that we're identifying, um, most of them, some of them affect the, um, the viability. So they're killing cells at higher concentrations. So these plots are showing as a function of the concentration of drug that we add, um, you can see that the viability is going down. Um, but, um, but many of them are not killing the cells. They're not stopping the cells from dividing. Um, but consistently we found that um, these top hits that we picked up are blocking the motility of cells. They're causing these cancer cells to be less invasive and less migratory. So the cells are moving a lot less. Um, and, and this is a, um, not entirely unexpected because of this relationship between cell deformability and invasion. We know that many of those biopolymers that are important for that shape stability are also important in regulating the force production of cells and, um, and how they can invade and, and, and move. So, um, so the bottom line here is that our, um, our mechanotype screening methods, I think, have some interesting potential to complement other methods used for drug discovery in cancer, um, such that might kill drugs that might target um, cell killing, for example. Um, these, these hits seem to be blocking the motility of cells. So we have some follow-up experiments going on um, to, um, to test the anti-cancer effects of these drugs. Um, but we also started wondering, you know, what else could we do with this data? We have so much data now because we've, we've looked at how the deformability of cells is changing in response to over 1,200 different compounds. Um, so this came back to the central question of um, what are those mechanisms regulating cellular mechanotype? Um, and so we started to conduct a meta-analysis looking at um, now the top 30 compounds and looking at the downstream genes, all the genes in these pathways um, and identifying the shared mediators across these different, um, these different pathways. Um, this is in collaboration with um, Sandra Srulik and um, Sha Yang at UCLA. Um, and so we've essentially identified some predicted key drivers of cell mechanotype um, which we're now in the process of validating experimentally. Um, but I think overall, um, oh, and I should just add that, um, that one of the candidates we, we found actually has much higher expression in cancer cells. Um, this is involved in, um, in ATP production in the nucleus, which is super interesting from a biophysical perspective as well um, to dig deeper into that and, um, and better understand what are some of these other players involved in regulating how cells are deforming, how they're generating physical forces that um, we don't fully understand yet. So, um, so this work is, um, is really towards this goal of, um, of understanding the, the set of molecules and pathways that are regulating how cells are sensing and, um, and regulating their own mechanotype. Um, we call this the mechanome. So, um, and there has been some work in um, understanding the contractome, how, what genes and proteins are regulating the contractile forces that cells generate, um, as well as the, um, those, those involved in adhesion as well. So we're taking baby steps towards this, um, this goal right now, um, sort of generating lists based on data curated from the literature um, and, uh, and so hopefully we'll be able to report more on, um, on the defining the mechanome soon. 
So, um, but I wanted to spend just a few more moments talking, um, giving a more concrete example of one novel pathway um, that we have discovered, which involves stress hormones. Um, this is work by postdoc, former postdoc Taeyeon Kim, who's now an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico. Um, and, and he was really leading this project to understand how these stress hormones like epinephrine and norepinephrine which regulate fight or flight response um, are affecting the physical properties of, of cells. So lots had been known about how these hormones affect um, the lung cells and heart cells, for example, um, but, um, but it was still poorly understood how um, cancer cells and, um, and more broadly epithelial cells, the types of cells that line um, tissues and spaces in our bodies uh, respond to these cues. So, um, so long story short, um, Taeyun um, discovered that these stress hormones, uh, or specifically activation of this beta adrenergic signaling pathway, are causing cells, these are causing cancer cells to be stiffer. So, he did these experiments with the filtration, showed increased retention. Um, we looked at using both our QDC method to measure elastic modulus and also AFM. Um, so we're consistently seeing, these are data with breast cancer cells, but across other types of cancer cells, also macrophages, um, he, he found as well, are getting stiffer with this beta adrenergic signaling. Um, and to get to the, um, the previous question as well of like, why is that happening? Um, we started to question, because um, these cells are also becoming um, more invasive, they're getting stiffer and more invasive. So we thought, well, is this because of these um, of actomyosin contractility. Um, so we measured then the, um, the forces generated by these cells. Um, and this we, um, we teamed up with Eric Chu at UCLA who develops these arrays of micropillars. These are flexible micropillars um, that you can plate the cells on and, um, and then track how the pillars get deformed. Um, and, and using again, knowledge of physics to be able to um, characterize the, um, the, how the force applied to pillars of a certain radius of a certain length um, with a known displacement, um, knowing again their elastic modulus, um, we can then extract the forces that cells are using to pull on these um, and, and contract. Um, and you can see from these, um, these plots here, the color bars showing you um, the force. Um, so you can see there's an increase in force generation with this um, this ISO treatment here, which is a beta adrenergic agonist. So it's activating beta adrenergic signaling and the cancer cells pull harder on these pillars. Uh, and this you can see from this plot um, here as well. So to really dig deeper into um, the mechanisms, um, we've been doing both experiments and also working with um, computational um, computational scientist Parag Khatir at San Diego State University um, to really understand what are the biophysical mechanisms of this increased force generation. Um, so we know that, that this is happening through a specific pathway um, that involves activation of this non-muscle myosin II that's binding to actin filaments um, and the beta adrenergic activation seems to be increasing the um, the length of time those myosins can remain bound to those actin filaments, um, which is enabling the cells to generate higher traction forces. So of course, forces that cells exert are really important for their motility and how they invade. Um, and, um, and clearly that can have um, relevance for how a cancer might spread. Um, but we also started thinking more in the context of the tumor itself, which is really a collection of cells in a, a, a sort of polymer matrix. Um, there's other types of cells as well, such as cancer associated fibroblasts. Um, but our thinking is that um, if we can block the, um, the force generation of these cells, um, that could decrease the tension in the tumor, increase the porosity of the tumor, and then potentially um, make the tumor more accessible for chemotherapy agents to get in and, um, and to act upon and kill the cancer cells. 
So, um, so this is one example of an application um, that we're currently working on um, to harness these, um, these commonly used beta blocker drugs um, to be able to, um, to, um, to increase the efficacy of chemotherapy treatment. So the beta blockers, I um, should mention, act upon those same receptors, those beta adrenergic receptors. So in the last minutes of, um, of my talk, I wanted to turn to another application um, which we've begun working on in the last couple of years, which is that of cultured meat. Um, so some of you may have heard of this um, emerging field um, where cells are growing, um, are, are growing ex vivo um, muscle cells from a, an animal. Um, and one of the goals here is to reduce the environmental impact of, um, of meat production. Um, livestock and um, current food systems practices are a really heavy burden on our environment, one of a, a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so developing alternative protein production methods um, is a, a promising avenue for the future. So the general process of culturing meat re involves removing so, some um, cells from an animal um, from a biopsy. It doesn't kill the, the animal. So, um, so this could be a more animal rights friendly way to eat meat. Um, the cells are then cultured in, in a lab setting or um, more realistically, they would be cultured in a bioreactor at large scales um, to be able to produce um, a sufficient number of cells that could be used to, to generate a food product such as a burger. So there's many challenges in this field, um, as one might imagine, not to mention um, public perceptions of, um, of both science and, um, and also um, science in our food systems. Um, but beyond those challenges, there's, um, there's challenges with the, um, the cost of, um, of making this happen. You need to use um, media to, in order to grow these cells and that media contains very expensive, costly growth factors um, that very often in our lab and in many academic labs, we use serum that's from a fetal calf. So this is clearly not sustainable and also highly costly. Another challenge is of course, being able to scale up these production methods um, so that um, we could generate quantities of, um, of cells that, um, that we could eat. And, um, and then of course, um, texture and taste is another critical challenge. So there's lots of interesting biophysics in, um, in cultured meat, it turns out. Um, maybe you already intuited that from um, my description of um, growing cells in a bioreactor, for example. Um, but typically cells are, um, need to be seeded onto some surface. So many of the cells in our body, of course, are attached to some scaffold and there's some biological tension, those contractile forces um, that are important for um, cells and the structural stability of, um, of muscle in particular. Um, there are efforts to grow cells in suspension as well, um, but regardless, cells are going to be floating around in a bioreactor subject to all of these physical forces of fluid flow. Uh, in addition, if you think about the, um, this scaffold or whatever the surface these cells are attaching to, the physical properties of that scaffold could also be affecting the behavior of the cells. And then you also have, of course, these media additives like growth factors or other, um, other um, media components. And, um, and we also know that the way cells respond to some of these, um, these chemical cues in their environment also really depends on their physical mechanical state. So all of these factors are really important for driving some of those phenotypes or some of those characteristics of cells that are going to be very important for the texture of cultured meat or that engineered muscle. Um, so we know that proliferation or growth is really important because if we need to scale up these processes, cells need to grow. Um, 
we need to differentiate um, precursor muscle cells into muscle fibers. Um, we also, of course, want to have good amount of protein production and also accumulation of fats for um, the, the taste and also mouthfeel. So I'll just briefly touch on how my lab is, um, is addressing some of these issues. Um, and this is, again, relying on, um, on our knowledge of um, cell physical properties um, and, um, and soft matter physics and engineering to be able to um, generate scaffolds that have tunable physical properties that can match the, um, the preferences of individual cell types. So I talked a lot about these muscle cells that are important for, um, for the meat, um, but fat is, um, is also going to be a really critical component for the taste, the texture, the flavor of cultured meat as well. So we've been working to, um, to use methods from the physical and engineering sciences, such as electrospinning to generate um, nanometer scale fibers. So these are actually more like hundreds of nanometer um, width fibers. Um, and this is um, mimicking the matrix of muscle. So when we seed these muscle cells, um, myocytes onto this aligned scaffold, um, they themselves align very nicely and start to fuse and form these myotubes, which is um, the component of muscle fibers. So, um, so this is an image here showing a bunch of aligned um, myotubes on these, um, the scaffold. The fat, however, fat tissue is, um, is much more compliant um, than muscle. Muscle is around um, 10 to 12 kilopascal and fat is much more compliant around several kilopascal. And, um, and so to accommodate the fat cells, we generate beads um, by making an emulsion and um, of a, a water and oil emulsion and embedding in the water phase and the aqueous phase, um, some protein like gelatin that forms a scaffold. It can cross-link and form a, a hydrogel bead that these adipocytes, these fat cells will attach to. And as they attach to the beads, they also start to attach to each other to form these larger aggregates um, that are essentially micro tissue, fat micro tissue. So we can assimilate these, um, these different components just by layering the microbeads, the, um, the aligned scaffolds, the microbeads, the aligned scaffolds to make what we call as um, marbled meat. Um, this is a picture of our, what we call mini meat. Um, you see it's still quite small, but, um, but I think the process is scalable um, and uh, we're relying on some of the um, inherent self-assembling properties of, um, of these cells on the scaffolds. Um, so I think that there's exciting potential to be able to improve and tune the texture, um, possibly increase the efficiency of the growth of these cells by um, using these scaffolds that we fabricate to mimic the physiological context of these cells um, and, and possibly decrease the cost of culturing meat as well. So, um, so there's lots of great opportunities for any students out there, you know, who are interested in um, this field. Um, there's a whole cultured meat modeling consortium um, that's really trying to better understand the physics of um, how cells are adhering to these microcarrier particles, how they experience the fluid shear stresses in a bioreactor setting, um, et cetera. So I'm happy to talk more about that later, um, but in the interest of time, I'll wrap up um, just by um, iterating some, um, some take home messages here. So I hope that I've um, uh, shown you that building new mechanotyping technologies that we can use to run at higher throughput, look at larger numbers of cells across a larger number of conditions um, can really help us to develop a more integrated understanding of cells as materials. Um, we touched a little bit on some of our work looking into the biophysical mechanisms of how cells are regulating their physical properties and, um, and how we can apply some of this knowledge um, to applications from cancer to, um, to cultured meat. Um, so with that, um, 
I'll, um, I'm happy to take any more questions and um, I'm grateful for the amazing team of, um, of researchers in my lab and funding sources and, um, and soon maybe you'll be able to come and visit UCLA again. Um, so thank you again and um, yeah, happy for any questions and look forward to our discussion. Great, thank you. So let's uh, move on to questions. Um, you can use reactions to raise your hand or. Uh, so just um, thank you for the really cool talk. Uh, I was wondering, um, have you ever noticed any kind of correlations between the deformability of cells and kind of cell to cell adhesiveness? Do they kind of go together? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we have not specifically looked into, um, into adhesion, um, but there's definitely, um, I touched on the adhesome um, studies that um, people have been trying to, um, to understand the, the proteins and pathways that regulate adhesion. And there's definitely overlap, of course, with the mechanome as well. Um, so, um, so, we haven't uh, we haven't specifically looked into that, but actually, my collaborator Para Katira, he's really trying to, um, and, and I think he, I'm not sure if it came out yet, has a paper with um, where he's starting to look at um, and dissect more um, links between adhesion and deformability. Yeah. Yeah, because it would be, in some sense, it would be kind of cool if the cells were both more deformable and less sticky, right? That would, in some sense, improve their motility through. Exactly. Components. Exactly. Yeah. But there's definitely a fine, um, it's, it, you know, you need some adhesion in order to, um, to grab on and, and pull, mm -hmm. um, but too much adhesion um, can really slow, like if cells are more adhesive, um, studies have shown that they're, um, that they become then uh, slower at, um, have slower motility. Because mm -hmm. you still have to break those adhesions every time you're, you're moving. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Um, more questions? I'll jump in. I have many questions, um, but I won't take all the time. Um, but very awesome talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I want to ask about was related to your single cell measurements. Uh, have you thought about connecting those to other applications like sorting or diagnostic at the single cell level? Like I could see it being used in a similar way as flow cytometry. Yes. Great question. So, um, so I touched on, um, but didn't go into great detail, are the MEMS device that we've been building into our microfluidic channel. And that was expressly with this purpose of being able to sort cells based on their deformability. Um, and um, that provides a really quick and easy way. There's various ways you can build a sorter into, um, into a microfluidic device, but um, this MEMS device was, uh, was one of the plans to, um, to be able to very quickly measure and then, um, and then within seconds sort the cells. Um, so actually my former postdoc, David Hultzle, um, he's now at Ohio State University and he's actively working on that. Um, now the sorting um, functionality. Um, and there are other groups that have been, um, have been um, pushing that frontier as well, like Todd Sulchak at, um, at Georgia Tech. Um, as well. So, um, so at this point, we, um, we've been um, using our, testing our filtration system to see if we could naturally sort of separate and not necessarily actively sort, but enrich for, um, for cells with different deformabilities. So, um, so that is some, um, some work that's still in progress. Well, because I think piggyback, piggybacking off of Mike and Chessie's question during the uh, talk, like if you could sort, then I think that opens up a lot of biophysical questions. You can then answer like how Mike was asking about like our cells were more cancerous yeah. and like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Yeah. It's a great point. So I think in light of the time, what we should do is maybe close the formal proceedings and switch over to informal discussion where we can pursue all of this a bit further. Um, so I'd just like to uh, thank you for that really wonderful talk, Amy. And I'm sorry that with Zoom, we can't really show our appreciation adequately. But uh, <laughs> thank you. That was great. That's all good. Thank you so much. Okay. So.